What's up, man? Welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, Jay? Glad to be here today with you, man. <laughs> man, I'm excited. We uh, we were fortunately connected uh, a few months ago at a, a Dallas podcasting event. So I've had the chance to follow you on social media, and see what you're all about. And so I'm excited to have you on the show today. But for those people listening, watching today's episode that you're new to them, tell us a little bit about yourself. Man, uh, so just in a nutshell, I'm, I'm a millennial. I'm, I'm a speaker, but I really live to see other people taking their gift and then being able to just enjoy and have the freest life possible. Because I mean, because I, I think that we shouldn't live a life that we didn't choose for ourselves. I, I, and, and, and that's it. I'm, I'm going to get carried away. So let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I love that. And I think that's one reason I was immediately drawn to your work and your message. Uh, in fact, your website, your tagline is I empower millennials and students to speak their success, believe in their greatness and create the life and business of their dreams. Uh, which I absolutely love because that aligns right in with our message of competing every day to find your true potential, to create your best career, your best life. Have you always had like this positive mindset, this attitude about life from day one, or is it something that you developed, I would say later in life, even though we're both still pretty young, but developed kind of later on? I would love to lie to you and say, yes, I've always <laughs> had this just optimistic mindset, but no, the shift happened. Uh, I was working a retail job and my manager one day, she was just, she always was the manager that came at a level 10 at eight o'clock in the morning, no coffee, no nothing. And I was like, why are you always so excited? Please be quiet, sit in the corner somewhere. And then uh, I got to the point where she realized that my attitude was impacting the store in a negative way. She said, Jonathan, I'm, I'm not going to tell you this. So I'm just going to tell you straight up. She said, dude, your attitude sucks. And I was like, Oh, God, that, that's, that's a little, I was like, Jake, that's a little rough. Like, you're going to just hit me with that. We haven't even opened the store. But from that point, she challenged me to look at life, focus on being grateful and focus on just everything that I have and the opportunities that I have as opposed to being negative. So that was really when the shift happened. And that was when uh, I became, I got to the place of where I became more grateful and just helping other people to become grateful as well, just to reflect. Just I, love, to mm -hmm. I love that. I was going to say, a lot of people listening, they haven't had that kind of shake you, wake you, make you change everything kind of moment where somebody speaks that truth direct to them. They don't have, sometimes they don't have those people around them that love them enough, care about them enough to tell them that truth. And so for you, obviously that moment, your boss just kind of woke you up and said, hey, listen, this is happening from you. This is how it's affecting us. And you committed to start making changes mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. What did those next few days, weeks look like to help you shift that mindset? So for someone listening that maybe they're struggling, they know they've got a little bit of a, a negative attitude or, or maybe it's just a very passive attitude of letting life come to them and, and mm -hmm. approach them versus them approaching and attacking life. What are things that you did from the beginning that helped you reframe your perspective and then also embrace that gratitude? Yeah, so from uh, j just looking back, next next couple of days, it, it, it looked like me just slowing down. Because uh, like you're talking about, sometimes we just uh, allow life to come at us. So I had to slow down. And with me slowing down, I had to start small and say, man, I'm grateful for having the opportunity to work at this store. I'm grateful for having this job. I'm grateful to be able to choose where I can eat a meal as opposed to somebody else who doesn't have those things. So I would just challenge the listener to, to start small because think every, everybody doesn't have the largest house or the nicest car, but you might have a house, you might have a car. And then just starting from that perspective and then growing from there. Because if we try to eat the elephant, then it's like, oh, what a, a total mind shift, shift my whole world, then now throw people off. But start small and just focus on writing. I'm grateful for my house, my bed, small things like that. I think then it would, would help shift the trajectory slowly but surely. I, I love two things you hit on there. One, the elephant, because we eat an elephant the same way we eat a bowl of Lucky Charms. It's one bite at a time, exactly. one small <laughs> bite, spoonful at a time. And so we get a lot of people get overwhelmed looking at the elephant and just saying, like, where's my spoon? What's my next bite? So you hitting on that is huge in terms of these changes or little things that compound daily over time. But the second thing you hit on was the writing. 
uh, and writing it down because there's a power in physically putting pen to paper more so than typing a note in your phone, more so than just saying it out loud or thinking it, like putting pen to paper is huge. Tell me about that because you're also an author and you've written a book. Mm -hmm. you, there's, there's talent and love with writing for you. In this moment in terms of the gratitude, were you writing a lot before that and other things or this was kind of that first step for you on a journey of I'm just, I'm gonna start putting this down on paper. Uh, before the, the well, I'm, first of all, I just wanna say, I just wanna touch on how you hit on Lucky Charms. I love Lucky Charms. <laughs> Well, let's, let's not get distracted. <laughs> Me too, man. A Lucky Charms and Count Chocula were like my thing Ooh. growing up and even probably a handful of years ago. So I laugh when I, I gave that analogy the other day at a talk and I was like, yeah, it's like, it's kind of like an elephant and a bowl of Lucky Charms. And somebody said the same thing. And they're like, that's my favorite cereal. That's, that's it, man. Cause you hit something. Everybody's not going to pick up on that. But, um, honestly before with me writing, well, what my writing consisted of before would be an occasional poem. And I would just write poem, and it wouldn't be l lining out poetry the way that uh, I guess the greats have done it or saying you have to use so many words here and there, but it was just poetry. But that's really irrelevant. Um. <laughs> no, but that's, that's how you would communicate and express certain things. So you were kind of working down that path, which later we can get into about your book. Um, but I'll let you continue now on the, on the gratitude piece of it. Yeah, so uh, really, uh, can you rephrase the question? I'm sorry, Jake, I lost you're, it. You're okay, man. So I, I'm curious from the physically putting pen to paper, writing down about the gratitude, it sounds like you were occasionally would write poetry just in your own style as a way to express communication, but now you were putting yourself in a position to express gratitude on a more consistent mm -hmm. basis. Uh, if you started writing down from day one, kind of one line, two lines, do you still have those journals? Is it something you continue? And, and how has it influenced your writing since? Gotcha. So uh, honestly, uh, I didn't continue to do that exactly, doing uh, gratitude, but that's a practice that I started. But now I have different things like a passion planner because I would write out different things on like sticky notes. I have sticky notes all over the place <laughs> and I would write to do's or then I began to write affirmations. Just because when you put things on paper, it's something about the accountability of it. You know, putting things on sticky notes and sticking them on your mirror and writing on your mirror, then it creates accountability. And then when you see this, it triggers that thought or that thought process of where I was when I initially started. It was like, well, Jonathan, you said you're grateful for having this house, so now you shouldn't be complaining about this house. Granted, there may be some things that you wanna change, but now you go back to that grateful place and you're like, oh, but I'm, I'm glad I do have this house. So really triggering that frame of mind and that perspective, I, I think has been really, really beneficial. And now uh, even with like the passion planner, I write things in there because it holds me accountable. It always holds me accountable going back to that thought. I, I love that accountability and writing it down. Not only that, but it gives you a focus for that day. Now, unlike a lot of people that may be listening to this that have started to make those shifts in their mindset, moving toward that more positive attitude, that daily affirmations and uh, just attitude and overall feeling of gratitude, you've chosen to take that a step further by stepping out, writing a book, speaking, sharing that message onward. Mm -hmm. What inspired that next step in your journey that a lot of people don't ever make? Uh, I, I think the inspiration came from a place of even when I began to be more grateful at that particular retail job, I began to feel like the message couldn't be expanded or the message couldn't reach the amount of people it was meant to reach from me being at, in that sole position. Because granted, the people would come in, I would have great conversations, we'd build great rapport, but after they left, I was like, oh man, uh, I don't know if I'm going to see that person in and connect with more people. And then I got to a place where I began to go burnt out. And it wasn't burnt out because I was ungrateful. It was burnt out because I was like, I feel like I'm meant to do more than what I'm doing now, which was selling jeans, ultimately. And then that was what really pushed me. And then uh, then wrote the book, uh, partnered with my dad, Dr. Fred Jones. Uh, and then I hired my dad as a coach. And from that point, then the book created the platform to share the message further and to speak more. So I'm intrigued by that heavily because of the working with family, which you don't see very often uh, in a lot of senses of choosing to almost hire your dad to help train you up in the, in the direction you wanted to go. What made you choose him over going someone else 
maybe an outside party? Mm -hmm. uh, well, honestly, to, to choose, I, I chose him because one, he was the one who really planted it within me. Because one Thanksgiving, he was like, son, what do you see yourself doing in five years? And I was like, I don't know, dad, writing a book. And he, he had the presence of mind to record me. He audio recorded me saying this, and then he later played it back. And uh, one thing I really appreciated about my father was the fact that I trusted him because I've so, I saw the work that he's done with other clients. And therefore, I was like, I don't know if I could even go outside because I don't know any of these people. And I had no desire to publish a book. But after he planted that seed in me, and then I paid him. I, I paid him. Best life lesson I would say my dad has ever taught me. Uh, and I paid him $5,000 to get my book published and help, help show me how to make it become a best-selling book. Then I was like, okay. I, 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 at that point, I, I, I bought in. Because like we're talking about competing every day. I think sometimes people don't compete every day because they don't buy into themselves. Or they don't buy into the journey or the process. But when you put some skin in the game, right. that changes. I think that changes the stakes a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it laugh, you know, used to, I would have the mindset, I know a lot of people do, about spending on certain things, a personal trainer, a, a gym membership, mm -hmm. uh, a coach or a mentor that works with you one-on-one, -on -one, professionally or personally. People are like, oh, that's a lot of money. I don't want to spend that. I don't want to pay that. But from the other side, like as a coach, like you want people invested in the process too, because you're obviously investing time and energy into them and financially absolutely put skin in the game, which is why we always care more about the things that are a larger investment for us. And we do the work. It's the fitness industry is built on gyms that charge 10 to 20 bucks a month that you never think about. It's on auto draft and you never show up. But if you're paying a hundred 150 bucks a month, or you're paying for a personal training session, you are there every single time because you have skin in the game. That's true. That's true. It, it's, it's just the investment. I think that's all, that's just tied to the mindset. It, it's, it's just, it's just tied to it because we, because you know, we'll go, Oh man, I can go to McDonald's, whatever, $5 a day, $10 a day, whatever, however often you might go to McDonald's, Starbucks, et cetera. And you're not thinking about it. But then, like you said, when we're talking larger quantities of money and thinking about how this is going to affect us long term, then this shifts something within our mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really important you said that. We had uh, Justin Murphy back on the, the show, I believe episode 79 or 80, uh, nutrition coach. Uh, he was similar. He, he had gone had nice car after nice car after nice car. And when he launched his nutrition coaching business, his mentor and coach was like, hey, here's what's going to cost you a month to work with me one on one. And Justin had to sit down and evaluate, do I want to keep my nice car or do I just want to trade it in and drive the worst thing I've ever had, knowing that five to 10 years from now, that investment of paying for the coaching and growth is worth way more than having a nicer car. And he did. And it was awesome to see, awesome to see him make that change because he's like, I'm driving the crappiest car I ever have, but I'm happier. I'm more successful. I'm surrounded by the right people now because I made those investments. And so it's huge for everyone listening to, to make those investments. One of the things I'm curious about with you, because you do a lot of work with uh, millennials and empowering millennials, there is the common stigma uh, and, and idea that millennials are incredibly entitled uh, mm -hmm. and that, that a lot of things should be given to them. You obviously see bits and pieces of that, but your job is to help empower them and allow them to step into themselves. For people listening to the show that perhaps work with millennials uh, in the office or, or their, their managers or directors. What are some things you educate on leaders and directors in terms of working with millennials to empower them in the workplace? Mm, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, well, ju just a few areas is one, like how, how we all know of like helicopter parents uh, and you know, the parents who are around and they, they, they see what their, their child is doing and just high and see what they're doing, but maybe the child might not be aware of what the parent is doing. So I, I like the concept of creating ownership uh, with, within the company because if, if you allow them to have a certain part of ownership, for instance, it's like, it's like, Jake, we have this big presentation coming up. Can you handle doing the PowerPoint? So now you give them the ability to, one, uh, put their creativity on display, but also still letting them prepare this, but ultimately before the big meeting, they prepare the PowerPoint, you have them present it to you before you go into the big company. So this way, now you're setting them up for success because you still have, ultimately have control, but you get something off of your plate by giving them a level of ownership to this. And then really, uh, uh, 
and really attacking the, 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 the part about being entitled, I, I think it comes to a, a point of helping the millennial or individual uh, understand that Nobody owes you anything. I know that's so rough, and I know that's hard to accept. Uh, being in the millennial generation, the ribbon generation, you know, participation trophy, great, great job. You complete, you completed this, so now you receive a gold star. But if we begin to attack that little by little, just showing somebody that just because you showed up to work, you don't, you, you don't get a pat on the back. You get a check at the end of the week. You don't get a check at the beginning of the week before you've done anything. So really helping them just understand that, even though I know that's like really helping people unlearn something that's been taught for so many years. But if you allow somebody to, to see that and see you get rewarded based on what you accomplish or what you really are able to uh, provide, th then I think that that helps create a healthier rapport in the workplace and then just a healthier corporate culture, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much, unlearning from not only the millennials, but all the way through the baby boomers of things that we were taught that don't necessarily help us advance forward. And, and so that's a huge one as well. Uh, similar to letting employees not only give them ownership of things, but it's okay letting them struggle a little bit in certain areas so that they learn where to look, where to study, where to research to get better and also building their grit. And, and that's one of obviously been a lot of the themes on the show is when your kid's not letting your kid quit a sport in the middle of the season, just like my dad never let me quit playing baseball middle of the season. Cause he knew it didn't, it wasn't that I hated the game. Suddenly it was that I was afraid of striking out or getting hit with the ball. And, and you got to work through those things because later in life, when you step into that boardroom and you step into that stage, like fear is going to start to whisper in the back of your head. You have to say, no, no, I've got other things to do. I'm going to press through this. If I don't like it, I'll, I'll stop later. But for now, like that's not going to be the deterring factor. So, man, Jonathan, I, I'm interested about 2019 for you. What is, what's on the docket? What are goals for you this year? Uh, man, so, so for me, a few goals are, well, one is I'm, I'm going to release my, my second book by the end of 2019. Um, so that, that's been big for me. And another piece, th this one might just seem like not a, not a big deal for anybody else, but reading more. Jake, I, I, I've got so caught up uh, the past few months just getting caught up in consuming YouTube content, getting caught up in listening to podcasts, and I allow myself to be removed from reading. But now I'm, I'm, going, I'm going back, like you were talking about earlier, going back to the basics, paper and pen. I'm going back to physical books, sitting down, planning time for me to read physical books because just like you, in order for us to be the best speakers, consultants, trainers, et cetera, we have to continue to learn. We have to stay on the cutting edge. We have to know what's new, but then also we need to know what's old faithful things like thinking grow rich. Right. Like, you, we have to know these things. So uh, that, 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 that's a few goals for me, but also just continuing to uh, add value to other people. Now I've opened myself up to, to now do consulting. So I'm, I'm open to helping those entrepreneurs or those millennials or those individuals who have ideas and they're trying to figure out where, where, what to do next, where to go next. So reading, of course, continuing to speak, continuing to encourage many uh, through, through, through that avenue, uh, consulting, and then also ultimately just expanding the podcast to serve more people uh, through the podcast and through that platform alike. I love it. I love it. So Jonathan, before we, we go today, I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about you sitting down. You obviously made the investment in your dad to help get it published. What inspired you ultimately to write that book? And, and tell us a little bit about it for those listening that, that your message and the things you've said have started to resonate with them and, and they want to know about this thing you've written. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 the biggest piece on really sitting down and, and writing the book was initially uh, like I said before, my, my perspective shifted and I began to help other people want to see the positive side of life or the more optimistic point of view. And the book initially was going to be entitled No Complain Campaign because that was what I initially started to help people become more positive. Uh, but then after looking at people like, oh, I don't know if that will be clear. So I don't know if that'd be too clear to people and I don't know how many people would want to purchase that. So then we shifted the book and then we entitled it Process 14 Surprisingly Simple Behaviors the skyrocket millennials to success. Uh, so throughout the book, it's an interactive self-help book. I share bits and pieces of my own story, and I talk about uh, being positive, 
I talk about being determined because I know that, that that's big um, with us when we have goals and if we get deterred or distracted. But I also unpack many things like being professional because it's so easy to watch TV and then some of these students, some of these young professionals, they might assume that, wow, this 16, 17, 18 year old entertainer who has red hair and who has all this extravagant clothing on, that that's the way that I need to begin to position myself to be successful in life. But in the book, I unpack, no, we need to, let's talk professional email address. Let's talk, uh, what, do, what do you wear to uh, maybe a black, a, a black tie event? You don't show up in swim trunks, <laughs> things like that. You have to be prepared for where you're going. And so really just setting people up for success, talking about being professional, being determined, being educated. Like there, there, there's so many, there's, there's 14 uh, different principles in the book, but I think being professional is a huge, uh, huge proponent of the book. Also being determined because like, like we shared earlier, if you feel entitled for success because your parents are successful and you get knocked on your butt, what are you going to do? Yeah. Helping people find that because at the end of each chapter, I have three to four uh, writing prompts. So the individual reads, they self-reflect, and then they write down in the book their personal perspective, their personal uh, expectations or goals and things like that. So that, that, that's really why I put the book together to help people be set up for success and to where that they can reflect and then jot down their thoughts and, and then ultimately help them get to their level of success, whatever they define it as. Man, I, I think that's an incredible uh, topic and even gift idea for anyone listening that has kids, not only in high school, getting ready to graduate to college or just came out as just an easy gift you can give them to help keep them focused on what's ahead, what that road ahead is. Because a lot of times as a parent, you'll tell your kids a lot of these things, but it's in one ear and out the other. But when a third party says it, when they see it on YouTube, when they hear or read it in a book, like, oh, this is amazing. I've got to do this uh, just because it's coming from that other source. So for someone listening that you're like, man, I know someone, uh, I, I parent someone that needs these kind of messages. What I'm saying is not working. Maybe this book could be it. I definitely want to encourage you to check out Jonathan's book. Uh, and speaking of Jonathan, where can we get connected with you online? Where can we learn more about what you talk about your books and things like that? Yes, sir. JonathanJonesSpeaks.com. And uh, I mean, on the website, it has all my social links, but I'm on, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, uh, but just, just JonathanJonesSpeaks.com is my website and my podcast is Speak Your Success. So uh, you can find access to all that on my website. Yep. And we'll be having them all linked here in the show notes. So for you listening, uh, it's in the show notes for you watching. It'll be down below in the comment section so you can get connected to Jonathan. Uh, because his message, his approach lines so well with the Compete Every Day message and, and everything we're about in grit and determination. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jay. Glad to be here.